Hey everybody, welcome to this week's edition of The Thoughtful Bro. Um, I'm so happy to be here talking about one of my favorite things in the world to talk about, which is the hero's journey. Anybody who has the fortune or misfortune of being friends with me has heard me talk at length about um, the hero's journey. And one of the things that you always hear about the hero's journey is that it is very male centric and it doesn't include women, um, almost at all, and when it does, in a very limited way. Um, and uh, Professor Maria Tatar is here today, and she's going to talk about um, why um, that is. And it, her book is really a compliment, I think, to, to Campbell's influential work um, about how to tell stories about heroes. So I'm going to get into all that in a second. But before we get started, a few words about A Mighty Blaze. Um, a Thoughtful Bro is here every Tuesday at 2, and we talk about what makes great books tick and what makes great authors tick. Um, we're an all-volunteer organization here at A Mighty Blaze. Uh, we are here to help writers reach readers during a time of COVID and beyond. Um, you can find all our interviews on the Mighty Blaze Facebook page and YouTube pages. We are not asking for any money at a Mighty Blaze. Uh, if you want to support us, you can just follow us on social media, give us a like. That's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, if you want to find out more about a Mighty Blaze itself, you can go to our website, amightyblaze.com, where you can subscribe to our newsletter. And through our newsletter, uh, you will get a listing every Sunday of all the author interviews we have coming up. A Thoughtful Bro is not the only show, obviously, on A Mighty Blaze. We have um, about five or six other shows every week um, talking to authors of all kinds who have just released books. So please check us out at amightyblaze.com. And if there's yet another way that you'd like to hear some of our interviews, you can subscribe to our Mighty Blaze podcast, which is now in our third season. So all of that is completely and totally volunteer driven and free to consume by you. But if you are in the fact, in fact, in the mood to spend money, please spend it on necessary books that shine a light on our traditional cultural views of heroism, both male and female books like the heroine with a thousand faces by Maria Tatar. Um, if, yes, look at that cover. We're, t we're, we're talking ahead of time about how great that cover is and about how the title sort of already begins to make your argument for you in the book. It's so great. We're going to get there in a second. Um, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, please just make your uh, comments. And if you want to ask a question, please just put them in the comments section and they will make their way to me. Um, next week, I have on one of my favorite theorizer theorizers about the craft of storytelling and the art of fiction. His name is Peter Ho Davies. Um, and he's got an amazing new book out called The Art of Revision. So that's next week. Um, but as for this week, I am very pleased to introduce Harvard professor Maria Tatar, who received her, her PhD from Princeton University. Um, her teaching at Harvard and her research includes uh, Weimar Germany, German Romanticism, Folklore, Children's Literature, and Cultural Studies. She is a senior fellow at Harvard's Society of Fellows. She's the author of several books on the Brothers Grimm and on fairy tales. She's the editor of Classic Fairy Tales, as well as the annotated Brothers Grimm and the annotated Hans Christian Andersen. Her new book is called The Heroine with a Thousand, a Thousand and One Faces, um, from Scheherazade to Carrie Bradshaw, from Cassandra to Nancy Drew. The Heroine with a Thousand and One Faces dismantles the cult of warrior heroes, revealing a secret history of heroines at the very heart of our collective cultural imagination. Um, Kirkus called the book fascinating, fun, and consistently enlightening. And as someone who admittedly is obsessed with the hero's journey, I just found the book a wonderful compliment to Joseph Campbell. Um, Maria, thank you for coming on the show and welcome. My pleasure to be with you. Wonderful. Okay. So um, folks, we're going to go over um, what the book is about. We're going to talk a little bit about who Joseph Campbell was and why he holds this kind of unrivaled position of influence on American cultural storytelling. Uh, and then we're going to talk about, of course, what Maria's book is about and how it points out some of the holes in, in, in Campbell's um, theory of the monomyth and, and the hero's journey. But um, I've here been talking for a few minutes. Maria, why don't you just kick us off and tell us what is this book about? I think I need to start with the origins of the book. That is, it is a pandemic project, and it was written in the dark nights of the pandemic. It was, you know, Carlos Fuentes tells us that all writing is a struggle against silence. And if you go back to those first days of the pandemic, I think you'll remember the eerie silence that enveloped us. 
It was as if time had stood still, uh, fear was surrounding us. And what were the instructions given to us? Stay at home, don't do anything. Don't go on a hero's journey. Don't try anything like that uh, because you are helpless. And one thing that happened was we developed a new notion of heroism, the health care workers, and also the scientists who were working 24 seven to find a way to heal us. And so, and in the dark nights of the pandemic, what did I turn to for consolation? But books, reading. And also I had in mind, you know, Nora Ephron once said, and I remember giving this piece of advice to someone who was in the midst of a crisis, be the heroine of your own life. That is, don't be the victim. You have to find in the midst of a crisis, a way to do something, uh, to uh, find something. So be on a mission in some way. I'll say one more thing about the origin and then of the book, and then we can get on to um, how I map out the heroine's mission, uh, not just an ordeal as I thought at first, not just suffering, but a real mission. And that is that, you know, it's a, and this is a cliche that as authors often say, I've been writing this book my whole life, uh, but I do take it back to a moment in a soulless, vast auditorium where I was taking one of those terrible standardized tests and I looked down at the prompt and it says, what is a hero? And here I was a very academic child who read all the time and my mind went blank and I felt this panic seizing me. And, and then I thought, well, Achilles, all that wrath and anger and rage. Um, and then I thought, Hercules, well, he's trying. And I, then I finally came up with some canned answer about courage. And I knew it was a bad essay. And I think that experience, that minor childhood trauma was in the back of my mind for many, many years. And so I started reading as if for life during the pandemic and discovering that there was an alternative form of heroism. That there was, on the one hand, Campbell's journey with its spiritual leaders and warrior heroes, but there was another model of heroism, and it was generally not always gendered feminine, uh, gendered female. So what were women doing while men were on these journeys? And the answer is they were often sitting at home, uh, sometimes suffering, but sometimes finding ways to survive, to help themselves, and to help others. So uh, while there are some fairy tales, there's some wonderful fairy tales about women setting forth on journeys uh, east of the sun and west of the moon, where the woman wears out, the young woman wears out iron shoes, she travels so far. They are really the exceptions to the rule. And generally you find that women manage through words, words are their weapons. Those are the only weapons they've got and they have stories to tell. And by broadcasting these stories, they can find a way to move toward justice, a form of, of justice and changing the world, changing cultures. So that's a, sort of a nutshell uh, version of the, of the book. Oh, yeah, that's a kind of wonderful overture to all the things we're going to unpack um, through the rest of the interview. Um, you touched on everything there. It's wonderful. Um, one, just to build on that one quote from the book that I loved so much that I feel like really cut right to it is here's something you wrote. Driven by conflict and conquest, Campbell's narrative arc utterly fails as a model of women's experience. Um, and I and I I just thought that was great, and and I and I know there's kind of a, a line we we need to kind of make sure that we walk here and 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 make clear that like your book is not an attack on Campbell, and like Campbell has failed, and he and it's you know and it's incomplete and it's inaccurate. It's more like he just didn't cover everything. He didn't. He barely even covered half of it. Exactly. That's this is the other half of the story. You're exactly right. And I should say, though, that, you know, this idea of the journey, uh, you know, what Campbell tells us is in some ways, I'll take back what I just said, a universal phenomenon. 
That is, we're always going on journeys, spiritual journeys, sometimes physical journeys. You know, to tune in to the Kardashians and they're constantly talking about this journey that we've been on. Right. You know? um, so, so it's a trope. It's become a trope. And it's a truism because, after all, there's always a call to adventure. And an or that's the beginning of the 12-stage journey. And then an ordeal. And then a return with an elixir, with something that has a healing power to it. So in a way, everything we do is driven by that. On the other hand, you mentioned conflict and conquest. Mm -hmm. So we have these warrior heroes who are not only seeking to conquer, but they are also, what are they after? Glory, military glory and immortality. Kleos, as the Greeks called it. You know, Achilles will live on forever because Homer tells his story. And that's an interesting link with the women who tell stories. Uh, but so so their goals are very different from the heroes, heroines that I identify in this book, who are often, as I say, trying to survive simply to survive, but also to find some form of social, social justice. Uh, through care, by caring about the people who are around them. Right. And I want to point out that you made a point in another interview that I saw of yours of um, about why you titled the book just the way it was. Um, and I think it's worth unpacking uh, the heroine um, with a thousand and one faces. And I think the choice of a thousand and one and also the choice of heroine uh, is very important. And I think as you've already brought up, um, there is um, a central part of the thesis here is that there is a different, not only do women um, kind of have different means of pursuing their goals, but they have different goals. Um, and so there is, you didn't want to say, I want a, a genderless noun to describe the hero. It, it's not, you wanted something specifically gendered. And I thought that was an interesting choice. Yeah. Uh the means, you talked about the means, and that is really important here because often I, I started noticing that all of these women were curious. They were seen as curious. Mm -hmm. And uh, that curiosity was often demonized, seen as something negative. Well, one day I, I looked up curiosity in the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, and discovered that Early on, sort of in the 15th century, curiosity really meant attentive care to something, turning to an object or a person and giving them a form of care, uh, showing concern, uh, and that kind of thing. So curiosity, suddenly I saw the curiosity and care were linked, and yet curiosity was so often seen as something positive when men were engaged in investigations and research and that kind of thing. But when you have Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden, who wants to eat from the tree of knowledge, uh, fruit from the tree of knowledge, she is seen as bringing sin into the world. Or there's Pandora, another foundational narrative. She opens the lid to the jar and releases all the evils into the world. So curiosity in women is demonized, and yet it's applied so positively in many other narratives where it, it uh, modulates into care and concern and empathy, which is today our greatest social virtue. And also, what I didn't mention in the book is uh, the idea of philanthropy. And philanthropy has gotten a bad rap uh, because for a variety of reasons, uh, the varsity blues scandal, the idea that donors have really raked in all this money and now, now they're going to give some, not all of it, but they're going to give some, they have so much money that they can actually afford to give away millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but if you look at the actual, the literal meaning of uh, philanthropy, it means love of humankind. And that uh, is something that I think is a trait that is shared by the heroines in my narrative. Uh, that is, they're other directed, they care about other people, and at the same time, they're practical because they too want to survive. Right. right. And thrive. 
So I think we should, at this point in the interview, just turn it back to, to the foundation here and just talk about Joseph Campbell and like set that up as a, um, a kind of what the context within which this book is, has been written. Um, so yeah. Joseph Campbell, for those who may not know, is a kind of cultural theorist and mythologist um, who taught at Sarah Lawrence College or Sarah Lawrence yeah. University. Um, his book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, by the way, the fact that Sarah Lawrence was at that time an all women's college is just one of the great ironies. Um, but he, um, he wrote a book called The Hero. What did you say? I know. I, I, I'm agreeing. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, Campbell's book, A Hero with a Thousand Faces, um, it was published in 1949. Um, the real, there's like two big moments um, in the kind of cultural history of that work, uh, which is the first is that George Lucas used it in Star Wars and it used modeled Luke Skywalker and the, the plot arc of the original trilogy um, on what he found in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And then uh, Joseph Campbell did an interview with Bill Moyer on PBS, um, which I forget the title of that interview series. Power of Myth. The Power of Myth. And that, um, I think, I mean, a lot of Campbell's work is a little bit esoteric and it's sort of, it's, you know, it's a little bit dense prose wise. And I think like that, um, Bill Moyer's interview and the success of Star Wars is what made it accessible to everybody and proved that it could work. And I suppose a third step in, in the cultural history of that work is Chris Vogler, um, who is a theorist about screenwriting, has written one, probably my favorite book about storytelling, which is called uh, The Writer's Journey. I'd certainly recommend anybody um, who's interested in the hero's journey. That is sort of kind of the ur text of the interpretation of, of Campbell. Um, and it breaks it down into like the various steps um, and so on. So, uh, uh, you know, um, crossing the threshold and, you know, meeting allies and enemies and, you know, getting the boon and the return home and all those things that you hear people who talk about narrative today talk about that sort of began with Joseph Campbell, was proved through Lucas, and then ended up in Chris Vogler's book, and then everybody read it. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit of the background here. But I guess um, I just want to say one thing about Campbell is that he seems to, at least this is what I hear, I'm not an academic myself, that he has a bad reputation among academics. And it's like discredited is often a word that is used. And it's it's mysterious to me because he's so vastly influential. It's it's not, it's certainly he could also be discredited and influential, but can you just clear that up for me about what his reputation is? Gosh, yeah, yes. And, you know, being, living in the academy, I have to say that, uh, for a long time, I was a kind of Campbell hater, and I put myself in that camp. I allied myself because I'd heard so many people denounce him. And, you know, I read The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and in, in, I think in, when I was an undergraduate, so, you know, you forget a good deal of it. And when I started rereading Campbell and writing this book, I grew to admire him um, in so many, I mean, first of all, he went global long before anyone else did. And he was adventurous. He left graduate school because they were trying to box him in all the time. Mm -hmm. So here was somebody who was the real deal in terms of intellect. I mean, he, he lives in a low rent shack in upper, upper New York state and just reads and then, and then becomes a, a prophet. And we have to talk about Sarah Lawrence too. Uh, so, uh, so there he is, um, and uh, going on his his own journey in a way. And then I should also mention, you know, the the date of the hero with a thousand faces. It's 1949, and here's what I also grew to admire about Campbell. Uh, when World War II broke out, uh, he knew he was probably going to be drafted. And he wanted to be a conscientious objector, a CO, a conscientious objector. Um, and then he decided he really had to do his duty, his patriotic duty and all that. Why was he a conscientious objector? One, he hated guns and cannons. He was an enemy of British colonialism. He had seen, you know, he had studied what had happened all over the world and understood the evils of British imperialism. And he also was outraged by the U.S. Uh, appropriation of the lands of indigenous peoples. So he was really a good guy. Uh, and, you know, he, he did miss the draft, by the way, by a year. So uh, he never, 
he never did have to become a soldier, which was something that he loved. And yet, you know, he's also writing about the warrior hero at a time when all of these men are returning from war. Um, and then it's so, you know, he's a, it's a complicated story. But as I say, I grew to admire his erudition. And also, when you watch uh, The Power of Myth with Bill Moyers, I mean, he's so charming and avuncular. And even though I don't, you know, I don't believe what he says about immortality, you know, to me, immortality is terrifying. Looking at the face of God forever is something really scary to me. <laughs> and I, I'm much more a fan of uh, secular faith what um, one uh, scholar at Yale, Martin Heglin, calls secular faith, where you recognize human fr vulnerability and fragility, and you do what you can in the here and now. Again, what are your weapons? Curiosity, care, uh, storytelling, and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so can you just summarize also what um, were Cambo's views on women? And I mean, maybe not just broadly, what were his views on women, like actual women in his life? More what I mean is what were his views on when people came to him with the question, which they did, why aren't there more women in your theories? What is the role of women in mythology? What was his answer? When a senior at Sarah Lawrence came into his office, um, uh, she was taking his course on comparative mythology, a very popular course, and everyone loved him uh, at Sarah Lawrence. And uh, she came in and she said, where are the women? And Campbell said, well, what do you mean? The, the woman gives birth to the hero. She's the goal of the hero. Uh, she's also the muse. What more do you want? And her response, I want to be the hero. And at that point, Campbell was dumbfounded by that response. That is, he really, he tells it and you can tell that you can see that he's perplexed and yet, you know, go to the end of his life and you discover that, I was going to say he's waking up, he becomes woke mm -hmm. in a way. <laughs> he starts to see that there are new models out there, that the times they are changing and that, uh, that something has happened that he's in touch with but he's not ready to tell another story at that point. He can just feel it in the atmosphere. And, and I think, you know, he says, you know, the old stories may not be valid anymore. Uh, and which is not to say we're gonna discard them. We still want them, but we wanna reinvent them. We want to make them new. We want to make them ours. Uh, you know, as I tell my students uh, in, in my course on, on fairy tales, you know, the, what the Brothers Grimm told in the early 19th century is not what we want to tell children today. That is, but we can still tell the story of Hansel and Gretel and just reinvent it, change the witch into someone who is, is really not so evil and who manages to rescue the kids and bring them back home. You can still have uh, some scary moments in it, but the scary person doesn't have to be an old woman necessarily. So let's, um, let's talk about the specific means and ends of um, what is traditionally viewed as male and traditionally viewed as, or as you're defining uh, female heroism. I mean, on, on the male side, I know you have this kind of conquest and conquering. I mean, I mean, really the Odyssey is sort of the foundational text of like what their traditional roles will be of a man and a woman. And I see we already have a question in the comments about Penelope and we'll get to that at the end. But, um, you know, it's obvious what Odysseus's um, means are and what his ends are and this kind of eternal glory and conquest and, and so on and so forth. Um, but then Penelope's at home and I think that you even mentioned that at Telemachus at one point, I think even literally says to her almost like, why don't you stick to your, stick to your knitting and shut up, mom. And, um, but you know, you, in the book, you talk about Penelope and you talk about um, so many other different kinds of, of female heroes. And I think it's important to say that you are not proscribing saying like women can only from here on in the future and by biological destiny, women can only be this. What well, I think if I may, what you're saying in the book is more, you know, throughout history and throughout our shared mythology, women just were not practically in a position in society to go be a Katniss Everdeen or go, you know, traveling across the world. I mean, and they, they were very much literally stuck at home. And so the question is then, what were their qualities that they had? Where they achieved their ends? And what were their actual heroic goals? 
Yeah. Uh, well, what I should say first is uh, to defend Odysseus a little bit, uh, because he's, he's less invested in immortality and glory than in getting home, finding a way back home. So he's a little different from Achilles. Uh, nonetheless, what I think is interesting, I'm so glad you brought him up, because he is the man of twists and turns. That is, he's clever and cunning. And so I would say that the same, that same trait can be found in heroines who are often sitting at home and they're engaged in the domestic crafts. And I like to think of craft in the double sense, uh, double meaning of, of the word. That is, on the one hand, they're knitting, sewing, spinning. But look at all the metaphors we use for storytelling, knitting a yarn, weaving a plot, and so on. And I think it's no accident that we have derived all of those metaphors from the workrooms, from the spinning, spinning rooms. Uh, and what did women tell? They told, they gossiped. Uh, they told each other uh you know, secrets and things like that. Uh, and I think sometimes those stories got enlarged and magnified. They turned into fairy tales. They, you know, when you're, when you're doing repetitive household chores, you need a lot of excitement. So mm -hmm. some of that gossip was magnified and amplified in the story. And I think that's how we got some of our really scary fairy tales, say Bluebeard or something like that. So they were telling stories, they were using stories, and I said earlier, as their weapon, uh, that was the, um, the weapon in their, in their arsenal. And uh, so they were broadcasting stories. And um, think today about the Me Too movement and how, what have women uh, used to change things, um, to change the culture. They've used stories, in this case, real life stories, and uh, put them on social media. Uh, and, and women in times past were, you know, staying at home, confined, uh, contained in domestic spaces. And yet they found ways to pass on these stories about how to survive and how to make things better for their children and grandchildren and right yeah i i um i love the part in the book where you talk about me too and just you know there, you bring up these um you know shahrazad carrie bradshaw lots of um these great female characters who derive their power mm -hmm. um and they're able to manipulate um other people around them you know for good or for bad um through their pa the power of their storytelling and their ability to speak the truth um so i, I want to ask just a slightly nerdy writer question here about structure, because one of the things going into the book, I didn't know um, if this was going to be a book similar to Vogler's book that, that sort of um, put forward an idea of like, there is a, there are different steps along the path for a female hero, but I don't think that's, that's not what's in the book. And so I just want to just clarify mm -hmm. that, you know, that traditional narrative structure of an inciting incident, a kind of call to action, a crossing into the unknown. I mean, I could certainly imagine um, mapping out a narrative of somebody in the Me Too movement that has an obvious inciting incident and a refusal of the call and then an embracing of the call right, and right. spirit, spiritual guidance and so on. Um, but so just to clarify, you're not saying that sort of the model of going through the heroic arc is different for women, right? You know, that's actually, that's a great point. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that uh, Campbell identified a sort of universal pattern and applied it to men. I would say I'm more invested in a reduced form of that. That is, you know, this call to adventure, the ordeal, and the return with some, a healing uh, potion, a story that will heal, that will change things. You know, when I initially, well, about halfway through the book, I was thinking of calling it something like the hero's journey and the heroine's ordeal, mm. uh, because I was so focused on the suffering of women, on, you know, what they had to deal, the unimaginable things that they had to endure. And um, at a certain moment, I had this aha moment, which was, no, no, it's not an ordeal. It's not, the men go through ordeals too, by the way. Um, so it, it, they don't just suffer, but they're on a mission. And anytime you're in a, on a mission, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have to fight those battles, kill those, slay those dragons, uh, meet those monsters, and somehow figure out a way to either get away from them or tame them or do something with them. So, um, yeah, so... 
So that, that, and I'm glad you saw that. That is, uh, you know, and again, I wasn't trying to fight a battle with, with Campbell. I'm totally on board with the model that he set up, but I'm trying to show how it's really different uh, for the, the trajectory, the pathway to heroism has been different for women. And by the way, you know, I'm not also not trying to set up a strict binary because um, in a way, they're just two models that have been gendered, male and female, at, in the past. But now I think we have this wonderful spectrum before us, and men can be heroines, or what what I you know what have tradition they can yeah. do the things that heroines traditionally did, and women you know can cross over too. So uh, so that is what is really interesting to me about. And I talked earlier about new models of heroism, and how we're always changing things up. Right. I think we're just at a very interesting time um, in our culture. I mean, I was thinking about some of these more what is traditionally called the badass chick um, kind of um, like right. model that is like so right. popular now in popular culture. I mean, this is the Katniss Everdeen's, the Ripley right. from Alien, Black yeah. Widow in Marvel. Um, you know, there definitely is um, just almost countless examples now of women taking these traditionally masculine means of heroism. Now, what their objectives are, I don't think anybody's going for eternal glory in the sense that um, Homer and Odysseus were, but regardless, you have these like action female characters, but then on the male side, you have like, you know, very important pieces of storytelling in our culture about Oscar Schindler, say Shakespeare of Shakespeare in Love, Gandhi, Harvey Milk. I mean, these are people who are using what you define as these mm -hmm. um, traditionally feminine qualities of empathy, concern, communication, storytelling, yeah. insight, truth speaking. Um, they are These men are using those to achieve their ends. Yeah, well, that is a great point. And uh, you're making me feel that I should have added a chapter. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you can't cover everything. And I was thinking, you know, Donna Tartt, uh, when she was writing The Goldfinch, she, she, said, she said, you know, I've got this gigantic canvas in front of me and just this tiny little brush. <laughs> and um, and I, I think I could have made this a 10-year project in many, I'm, I'm not sure it would have been better, but there's, I think, you know, what you've just said made me realize that what I wanted to do with this book was to start a conversation. And it's precisely, you know, hearing responses like yours that make me glad that I went ahead, and, you know, published and didn't spend another another decade on the book. Um, well, one thing that we were talking about in the green room, and maybe this is a good time to talk about it, is I had asked you about what the response to the work had been. And could you just share with us a little bit about what it has been? Because I thought it was it was very... Oh, well, well, I mentioned that I've only gotten one piece of hate mail so far, <laughs> um, relieved. Uh, and uh, But what has been extraordinary to me, two things. One, the number of people who have written to me with their stories. And these incredibly moving stories, and they tell me how the book has resonated with them, and you know has somehow made them under help them to understand and think about and talk about uh, what they have been been through, and uh, that to me was just uh, you know so wonderfully rewarding. And then uh, I've also gotten many many uh, messages from people who are writing their own narratives who are writing fiction or screenplays or short stories and uh, they want to share the writing but you know I always feel a little bit oh you know I'm not good at placing people's work so I feel a little disappointed that I I know I'm not going to be able to help them at the same time I, I printed everything out and when the holidays come I'm going to sit down and, and uh read as much uh, as, as I can of this. And I love the fact that people are self-actualizing through writing, mm -hmm. because that's part of the story that I tell in, in this book. Can you actually explain that term to me, self-actualizing? I mean, it comes up in this context, and I know you say in the book that it's in traditionally in the monomyth, it's only men who can self-actualize, and women are just kind of more inert or like the prize at the end of the journey. But um, what does this phrase mean to self-actualize and why is that part of like the hero's story? 
Oh, that's fascinating. You know, I remember years ago, someone used that term with me, sprang it on me, you know, and he, he said, you know, writing is such a great form of self-actualization. And like you, I thought about it, you know, what does that mean? And I suppose there are different aspects to that. First, uh, it's just incredibly rewarding to have words on a page. You know, there's just something, you know, you feel when I write in the morning, in that, by the afternoon, I feel I've accomplished something, I've done something. But then also the way that writing works as a kind of way of, well, John Didion said it best. Uh, she writes in order to understand what she thinks and how she's thinking about that. Because you've got this uh, kaleidoscope of real life events, you know, things that, that the swirl of of events going on and to try to make sense of them. You know, the symbolic always helps us navigate the real and, and the symbolic is what we put on the page. It's not reality. So uh, we're sort of, it's a way of helping us create meaning in our lives. And the other thing that I've discovered, uh, I always alternate books of, you know, one that is really hard work and then one that is just for fun. Uh, this was a little bit of both, but one of the things that I decided to do was write something for, my grandchildren and grandchildren, uh, not really a memoir, a shorter form than that. And what I discovered as I was writing was suddenly I remembered so many things that I had just erased. So it's a, a way of, you know, uh, writing becomes a way of opening up your brain and getting to know yourself in a way, your identity. So there, there's so many different aspects of it. But, but I think self-actualization is a term that kind of helps you figure out what you're doing when you're at the computer. And, and, and I've also always kind of, in my understanding of that term, just taken it as a kind of self-empowerment. And it, it's like it's, you're stepping forward into the world and you are no longer somebody to whom the world is dictating the terms mm -hmm. of your life. You are now dictating the terms back to the world and saying like, I am here, I matter, I'm taking my life into my own hands in some way. Uh, oh, exactly. You know, it gets us back to what Fuentes said. I mentioned earlier, uh, writing as a, a form of resistance to silence. And, you know, I, I am so it and, you know, I mean, maybe back to immortality, which I've sort of said, you know, was a negative. It's, uh, I mean, that you're well, storytelling is a way of remembering, of creating histories. And we all want to know what our ancestors, what our ancestors went through. This is why most of us love to study history and why history has taken this social turn where we're hearing not about, you know, diplomatic history or the wars, but about the stories of individuals who were heroic, who were resistance fighters, uh, who did all kinds of um, things that we want to know about and remember. Okay, just a few more questions and then from me, and then we're going to take a few questions from the audience. Um, so first, I just, as the conversation is going on, a few different questions have been sort of um, building up for me. So one is, um, if we could just go back to a moment ago when you were talking about some of this fan mail that you received and people would say, it sounds like they're sort of feeling seen by the work. Is that it? I mean, can you just, just without revealing obviously who the person is, just talk to me about like just one of those letters, like in what way specifically did your book help that person? Oh, well, I, I will tell you about the first one, which had the biggest impact on me mm. and which was both heartbreaking and uplifting uh, because it was a long, uh, what it, there's now a genre called the abuse narrative, abuse yeah. memoir. Yeah. And it was that in maybe 15, 20 pages. Mm. And I read it with, with tears in my eyes mm. you know, because the struggles this woman had gone through were so unimaginable. And yet it was also a story of tremendous courage because the writing helped her find a way, not out, and she'll always live with the trauma that she experienced. But uh, somehow for her to read a book about other women who had been, you know, Philomela in ancient times, who is raped by her brother-in-law, uh, tells him, I'm going to re I'm going to broadcast this to the world. And what does he do but cut out her tongue? So my book is also about all the forms of silencing that women were subject. It's not just about storytelling, but because storytelling was a weapon and it was dangerous, there were all these efforts to, to silence women. So her uh, 
you know, reading about Scheherazade, who manages uh, to live uh, by telling one story after another. Um, and she wrote about the strength that she derived from that. So, you know, as I would say, that, that I think was the most powerful one because the trauma was the deepest. And she also told me so much about it. Mm-hmm. But, but then I think, you know, there were others who just, you know, told me that the book resonated with moments in their lo- moments of crisis where they felt, you know, that they were just outnumbered and defeated. And all they could do was tell their story. That was, it wasn't even a weapon for them, but like the only thing I have is my story. And it may not get out there. It may not ever get out there. And the hopelessness of that. Wow. All right. Um, Let's take a question or two from the audience. Folks, feel free to pop a question in um, if you have one. But let's throw a question or two up on screen. This is from Grant Catton. Hello, Grant. Um, Can you discuss Penelope as the true hero of the Odyssey? Uh, Well, great question. And for the answer, you can go to Margaret Atwood. Um, her Penelope on, which I think is an incredibly underrated book. Now, I will say this, though. She does not turn Penelope into a heroine, uh, but she shows Penelope in, uh, you know, all her, her multifaceted identity, the different aspects to her, and nobody's perfect. And, you know, she has her, remember the 12 slave girls who are the 12 girls who were enslaved, who, uh, yes, uh, were hung at the end of the Odyssey. I mean, Penelope is also complicit in that. Um, Could she have done something about it? Yes, she could have. Uh, So she's no angel. Uh, Nonetheless, you know, Penelope has managed to use her cunning. We talked about that earlier, you know, this craft, uh, craft in the double sense of the term. And so uh, hers is, there's a story there which Homer does not completely elaborate. But today, the great thing is, is we we now can retell those stories from ancient times. Uh, And we have Margaret Atwood, but we also have uh, writers like, Oh, Natalie Frank, A Thousand Ships, or uh, Pat Barker's The Silence of the Girls, Madeline Miller, wonderful uh, uh, book about uh, Circe. And, and so, so, you know, it's a, it's a new world, and we're beginning to understand uh, that there were these other forms of hero and other stories that were never told. Can I just, we'll, we'll take another question from the audience in a second, but can I just follow up there? I mean, um, we've talked so much in the last 40 minutes about um, the different means of being a hero and the different objectives of being a hero. But I just, let, let's take a step back and Maria, just answer this basic question for me. What is a hero? What What is heroism? I mean, is there a way to, to define that? Uh, well, I would say there, you know, and I don't mean to dodge the question, but it's inflected differently in every era. So you go to Homer, and gosh, you know, we all read, uh, no, we didn't all read it, but, you know, we we, we read, the, when you read, if you read the, the Iliad, you were on Achilles' side. Uh, he was the hero. And, uh, you know, you thought of the warrior as the hero, and you thought of immortality as the goal. Uh, Our culture is different now. I think high school students reading the Iliad are going to think very differently about about Achilles. So, and as I said, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we redefined heroism. You know, what was heroism in the 50s uh, was not what we think of as heroism. Uh, today, so and and I, you know, that, I think that's a good thing that our culture reinvents what it means to be a hero. You know, we, you can think of anyone. Anyway, Sully, remember Sully? And I mean, he was our great uh, uh, cultural hero. And um, and uh, so so I mean, that idea of maybe with Sully, there's a little bit of a clue there, because what was he doing? 
he was caring for the passengers on the plane. Uh, it wasn't just, it was a matter of survival, personal survival, of course, too, but it was for the women heroines, too, for the, our, our heroines as well, survival. And then you care about other people and you do everything you can to save them. So I, I think that's a model maybe that helped us define what it means to be a hero today. Wonderful. And I've noticed that as well, when you look at kind of like what the military gives its highest honors to, often um, these presidential medals that are given out, I mean, in, in World War II is about, you know, men who bravely charged, you know, the, the, the enemy bunker and, and, and killed 20 men in one day. And now it's about somebody who sacrificed himself on a roadside bomb to save other people. I mean, there is a great shift in the nature of heroism for men right now. Oh, that's incredible. I, you know, that is something maybe you should write about. Yeah. And uh, because that's, that's a real shift, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, let's do one more question from the audience. And then I'll have one more before we wrap. Um, audience question, what is and are the kinds of heroines that you wish we saw more of? What are the kinds? What's the kind of heroin heroinism uh, that you see underrepresented? Uh, uh, well, great question. And there I would say, uh, you talked earlier about these uh, new heroines, uh, these, you know, who are armed and ready for battle and that kind of thing. So are we, you know, making our new heroines in the image of the old models? And that's a notorious, but also look at something like Get Out where we have uh, the Bluebeard story, but now with the wife as the, um, as the serial murderer. That's so interesting. I never thought of it that way, but that's perfect, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, so we have also the anti-hero in emerging, or Ex Machina, another example, Alex Garland's Ex Machina, where uh, it's the robot, I and mean, we have a lot, our new monsters are cyborgs and uh, robots and, uh, you know, AI in, in general. So I guess I would say, who do we need to see more of? I, I guess I would say, I think what I want us to do is look at the whole spectrum and try to understand what are the possibilities for the future. And, and now let's get rid of the gender norms and let's think about, you know, what what's what sorts of, of um, figures do we want to lionize and enshrine as uh, sort of possessing the best traits, uh, the traits that we admire in our in our culture? What have they done? And so, and maybe that's the point. Is let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Let's all figure it out collectively and um, sort of navigate our way into the future with a better understanding of what men and women and uh, non-binary people can, can do. Right. There's a wonderful coda in the book about um, the Mars rover and how it's called curiosity. And I think what was the, the other one was called perseverance. And, and, and you say, well, maybe the next few rovers will be named after other traditionally feminine qualities like compassion or care. And I thought that was just such a great way to kind of sum up the way that we're moving in a different direction, kind of broadening uh, traditionally gendered heroism. Yeah, uh, thank you for mentioning that because I think that is an interesting point to make in the context of you know what I just what I talked about earlier, empathy. And you know, if you go to schools today, I sort of <laughs> and as I talk to parents of school children, I mean, children get beaten over the head with empathy and kindness. And I worry about that because children are wonderful contrarians. And we don't <laughs> you know, we want, want to be careful not to, you know, uh, uh, sort of keep uh, uh, telling them stories about, you know, we, we need to give them a rich array of, of virtues and tell stories that don't necessarily have a moral or a message, but that model what it means to be a hero or a heroine and all, all of those things. So uh, let's look at the whole ring. Let's try to promote curiosity and compassion and care. I, you know, that's action. I, empathy is feeling, care is action. And maybe that connects with the idea of heroism. You're actually doing something, not just feeling sympathy. Wonderful, that is great. Um, so um, we're gonna wrap here, folks. I'm gonna ask one last question just before we go, and it's Maria. Tell us who your favorite hero is in your whole book. Oh. 
on oh. heroin, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, well, just in general, you know, I, I will um, say that, you know, in a funny way, it has to do with whatever I'm reading on a particular day. Mm -hmm. uh, so the last time I was asked that question, I came up with Dorothea in, in Dor Dorothy in Dorothy in Middlemarch. Uh, what is on my desk now? Hmm. Uh, my favorite. Oh, maybe, you know, Gretel in Hansel and Gretel. Because, you know, she's been weeping and doing nothing the whole time. And uh, what does she finally do? She uh, takes action and saves her brother. Mm -hmm. And I love that story because it's one about sibling solidarity. So uh, uh, she is my childhood heroine. Beautiful. All right. Well, Maria, if you could just hold up the book one more time, folks, go ahead and make an impulse buy. Do the heroic thing. Be a heroine. Buy this book. Um, it's a great Christmas present. Somebody was commenting uh, that I, I know just what to buy for my mom for Christmas. Um, so go out and buy this book. It's, it's a wonderful read. It's a, it's a great compliment to Campbell if you're um, a reader who wants to understand our kind of cultural history and views towards female heroes, but also if you're a writer like me and you're looking, you know, how can I um, create great heroic stories for the women in, in, in your book or your screenplay? Um, it's a great book for that too. Um, so Maria, thank you so much for coming on. It was such an honor. Thanks for the great talk and thank you for inviting me. You got it. All right, folks. So we'll see you next week on A Thoughtful Bro. Uh, on The Thoughtful Bro, we're talking to Peter Ho Davies on The Art of Revision. So another great one for writers. And uh, we'll see you then.